All right, welcome to Standing for Truth. I am your host, SFT, and today we have an extremely exciting show for everybody. We have, it's a blessing to have John McKay, the creation guy, back with us here today. This is not, uh, John, your first time. I've got an entire playlist uh, where we have been a blessed enough. It's been a privilege to host uh, the entire creation uh, research team several times. And uh, it's always a, a must-watch show. So, uh, John, thanks so much again for giving us your time. There's only, only one correction we need to make in there. My father would roll in his grave if he heard you call me McKay. Um, <laughs> McKay. We, we, we invented the word, the creation guy, John McKay, because Canadians are used to McKays rather than McKays. So there you are. That's the only correction. It's an intelligent design correction. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. And I'm Canadian, so that's uh, that's what's to blame. So John McKay, the creation guy. I think I got it uh, down pat now. I appreciate that, John. And uh, today's topic, I'm really excited for. Uh, we've been excited for a few weeks now. We've had this event uh, set. John, the uh, the topic is design the final proof. So uh, before we kind of get into that and, and give you the floor, John, I wanted to uh, uh, ask everybody to please uh, keep our brother in Christ, Joseph Hubbard, in prayer. Uh, he's improving. He's doing a lot better. And Joe, we are uh, thinking about you and, and please get well soon. Uh, Brother Joseph's been a, an incredible blessing to this ministry as well. And just a quick reminder, actually, for everybody in the audience. Um, I know this week is, is packed with events. So tomorrow at four o'clock, we've got Dr. Joseph Kazil will be here for a technical presentation on what is junk DNA. So that's going to be a ton of fun as well. Uh, that being said, we've got our award winning co-host, George Bond, here as well. George, thank, uh, <laughs> thanks for being here, brother. And any words of introduction? <laughs> uh, I'd like to thank John because uh, I think every time I've asked him to come on, he's never said no. He, he's a true Aussie, actually. So good on you, John. I've, I've got my thumb up. Good on thank you. Up. Thank You're you. Okay. Thank <laughs> I'll do it. I'll do it for you, John, or for uh, George. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. That's, <laughs> so I like to start off, John, uh, with every one of these streams by saying. Um, May the Spirit of God open your eyes to the light, your ears to the truth, and your heart to your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen, Amen. brother. Amen. Amen. Well, John Mackay, uh, I'll hand you the floor if you had some uh, words of introduction and, mm -hmm. uh, and and kind of get right into the, into the topic. Okay. No trouble at all out here. Um, for those of you who are used to watching me on there, you'll notice we have a different background. We had the uh, local council and the power people shifting all of our power lines and poles. And so I have no power at my office, no Wi-Fi, no anything. So grateful to my uh, office lady, Linda, and uh, enabling us to use her and her husband's house this morning. And a great breakfast we had here too in Australia because it's not yesterday over here like it is in Canada. We're already ahead into uh, this morning <laughs> and, and a great time is going to be had by all okay the subject design the final proof it grew out of quite a few university lectures i gave some of which were recorded some of which were very unpopular i mean i was asked to go to griffith university out here which is our local and first humanist university in the whole of australia designed to leave god out of everything so i packed the auditorium and we dealt with creation, the final proof, design, the final proof. I'll tell you what, there were so many people on the staff who wanted to get that lecture banned. Amazing. Why would they bother? You know, someone put a, a statement up that design is so obvious. How could anybody ignore it? How could they just dismiss it? Well, if you like to do a little bit of history, there's a Scottish philosopher, there's a Scottish geologist, and between the two of them, they did to death the common argument, if you see a watch, it means there's a watchmaker. And if you see a boomerang, there's got to be an Aboriginal Australian somewhere. And that makes perfect sense to the average person until the philosophers get hold of it and they say, oh, we're dealing with life, the origin of life here. And what's true for the watchmaker I mean, nobody believes that metal can actually arrange itself into a watch. Nobody believes that metal can turn itself into springs. Nobody believes that arms get there by themselves. It's obvious that if you see a watch, you need a watchmaker. But that's because a watch is not alive. 
a boomerang is not alive. But when you look at man or worms, they are alive and given long enough, the bits and pieces in, in nature can organize themselves. Actually, that's a good definition of evolution. Evolution is any process where you leave out intelligence from outside. It's anything that can happen by accident. It's a natural process, right? Given long enough, every possible combination that can occur. So in the end, only the ones that work, the survivors, survival of the fittest, right? They are the ones that are here today, and it only looks like it's designed. Well, throw in 200 years of that being hammered to students, and you will see why the average person thinks, well, design is all right for toy cars, but it has nothing to do with how my brain got here. My brain is, is the result of millions of years of evolutionary accidents. Okay, it also grew out of a, a debate that I did in Canada. Me versus four professors from the University of Saskatchewan, and uh, they lost. Uh, the result, the local education board kid said, can you come and show us how to teach creation? Well, creation, creator, creator, an intelligent designer. So we needed to come up with a way to show students they could think about design and they could figure out, hey, what you need for a watch, you need also for the person who's wearing the watch. Okay, so let me give you a brief summary of what you'll see on our video, Creation, the Final Proof. It is there on our, our creationresearch.net. You can look it up. Um, you, you can actually download these as MP4s now if you want the whole following of this series, and I'll come back to that. Um, I'm going to start with a thing that people find simplest. I love using these things, particularly in the USA, because I give them an assignment. Um, the assignment's very simple. What makes a boomerang come back? Some of you Aussies are watching, remember that old British song, Ma Boom Rain Won't Come Back. I throw the thing all over the place, practice lies black in the face. Yep, it's unwoke today to, to use that sort of thing. Um, but here's a boomerang. Now, everybody who sees a boomerang is sure of one thing. Somebody existed before it, somebody who's not a part of it, and somebody who's smarter than it actually made a bit of wood do what wood won't. Did you catch that? A boomerang is a piece of wood that doesn't come back, being made somehow to come back. Um, all right, so I give the, the students in the class, I hand around a boomerang. I mean, if I'm in Kentucky, they think this is fabulous. They've all wanted to throw a boomerang. You throw it? Well, I ask them, have you made a boomerang? Yes. Did you throw it? No. Did you throw it? Yes. What happened? It didn't come back. It smashed the window. Uh, hit my baby brother in the head. Um, most of them, when they make a copy of it, miss a couple of little details. Now, if you can see this carefully online, you look at the shape of it, right? It's curved on the top like a bit of a wing, and it's got scallops on either side. But one end, if you get very carefully, whoops, I've got to practice this with a camera here. If you get very carefully, one end is beveled and the other end isn't. So here's what happens. You try and balance it, and it will balance like that. It doesn't balance out there. It keeps balancing that way. So the boomerang is trying to, if you throw it, it's trying to come down towards its center of gravity. But if you throw it too, one end will lift up, and the other end will keep going straight. So you think carefully. You throw it, and it doesn't matter, by the way, if you start this way or you start this way, because very soon that will be that. So you can throw it any way you wish. Don't throw it on a very windy day because it'll go straight up in the sky and probably land behind you and won't circle around and come back. All right, so here's your boomerang. You keep throwing it and, well, it's always trying to fall back to the center of gravity and it's always trying to flip. So it will go round and round and round until it comes back and when you get good, it will land in the hand that threw it. A pretty clever design that nobody believes happened by itself. Do you get that definition? An evolution, according to every rule we've got in biology, is something that can happen by itself. Matter plus time plus chance um, gives millions of years of evolution. Whereas the boomerang is wood plus man plus intelligence, plus a bit of energy. I mean, you go home and make one, you need your dad's sort of little, little saw, you cut the wood out and then you shape it. It doesn't happen by itself. You use a bit of power 
a bit of energy and you have a plan. The reason why the kids in the schoolroom, you didn't usually get it, is they forgot that bevel right there. There we are, I'll get it in the right place. They forgot that bevel. Um, the shape looked good, but the design was different. The end result was it didn't come back. So to summarise where our whole one and a half hour lecture to Griffith University went, there were all the students went, whoa, yes, I can see it. And many of the lecturers went, Arr! you see, a creation is easy to recognise. Not only is it something that can't happen by itself, it's something where matter is involved, where a bit of time is involved, where energy is involved, but more important, there's an intelligent design imposed upon the top. I mean, think carefully. This is made from a tree. The Aborigines have special trees. If you live with them for a while, you actually get to know which tree roots they use because many tree roots underground will go like this and you pick one corner, you heat it up and, and you cook it and you then turn it into a lovely shaped boomerang. Matter plus time plus energy plus the knowledge of that little bevel there. Without that, it won't come back. Plus the knowledge of what angle you need to make this. Hmm. Matter plus time plus energy plus intelligent design gives you a boomerang. Time plus chance never does. Okay. Now, if you want to know a way to say that, there is more information in the end product than there is in the beginning product. Wood doesn't come back. Trust me. My dad was a Scotsman. We've been throwing trees for a long time and trees don't come back. Um, perhaps that's one reason the Romans found it no trouble to march through Scotland. We throw trees and um, they threw spears. All right, you have a look at our boomerang here. And here's another way of defining what a creation is. The properties of the end product are not due to the properties of the stuff it's made from. The properties of the end product come from here and they're imposed upon the wood. So the wood has more information in it and the information actually came from outside. It came from the creator. So you can recognize a creation because the end product does things that the stuff it's made from can't do. Now, that's all very, very simple. But the fact is, you, you use that all the time. We make a cake. Cakes are made of flour and water and eggs and sugar and that. Now, none of those things do cakes by themselves. None of those things, no matter how long you leave them. I mean, you're going to sit there and leave the milk stand for a thousand years. It might turn into microbes and crawl out of the class, but it's not going to make a cake, you will find that time becomes your enemy. You will find that even if you want to make a boomerang, matter, well, that's the problem. You see, the matter will rot. Given long enough, you will find you'll have to get another bit of wood to start a boomerang all over again. When you're dealing with creation, time is your enemy. Now, George and, and the whole team here believe one thing. God made the world. He's the outside intelligent designer. He's the one who said, test everything and keep only that which is true. Prove all things as First Thessalonians says. He doesn't mind you trying to test creation because you're, you're smart enough to figure out that's a creation. Didn't happen by itself. In fact, doesn't the world go around the sun and come back to the same spot? Perhaps you need to think about it. It's an intelligent boomerang on a round scale. Oh, you never thought of that. What would you need to actually prove the universe has been a creation? Well, look at it. The properties of the end product don't come from the stuff it's made of. Keep that in mind. The end product has more information in it than the stuff has got information that it's made from. Oh, yes, wood definitely has information. It's got enough information to tell you it's wood and not water. Ah, so you can work out how much information is in something. Um, let's go one step further. I have here... Uh, what have I got? I know, I've, I've got a, a, a dinosaur skull. Now, this is a cast. It's one I take to schools. Uh, and it's made of tough fiberglass because I hand it to the students. Because I know one thing, time and chance will ruin this. They'll drop it accidentally. Yes, accidents don't improve things. So we took a real dinosaur skull and we made a copy of it using our intelligent design. And we made fiberglass do what fiberglass don't. Uh, there's our definition again. The end product has got more properties than the fiberglass we started with. In, in fact, if you take your dinosaur and you actually look at it, that's a pretty complicated animal. So perhaps we should start with a simpler one. You see, the Scottish philosophers 
and the Scottish geologists together spent ages destroying the argument about if you've got a watch, you've got a watchmaker. And you and I need to unravel their foolishness. Yep, that's what the Bible says it is. Only the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Some of you have seen me interacting with Richard Dawkins on TV. Now, Richard Dawkins is a highly intelligent man. Trouble is, he's an atheist. And one of the consequences of atheism, well, I'll, I'll quote God because he's more of an authority than I am. He says, only the fool says in his heart there is no God. So Richard Dawkins can recognize the evidence that didn't happen by itself. And he thinks his brain got there by accident. So some of his conclusions <laughs> actually come. Well, I know some people would be uh, sarcastic enough to use them as evidence that his brain must have evolved. But in reality, his brain is made of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, none of which do brains all by themselves. No matter how downhill his thinking might be, his brain shows all the evidence of originally being a creation. Originally, yep, because he came from his mum and dad, they came from their mum and dad, they had the DNA for brains. So you get back to the chicken and the egg. Okay, in the beginning, there was a brain. There's no other way you can get one. Oh, perhaps we go back a bit simpler. I, I brought in some visual aids this morning. I went out of my garden early and I thought, I know what we need for the guys on STF. If I can find them in here, I just got to put this there. Where will I get my fork here? I know, I, I know you're in here, guys. Come on. Oh, there we are. There we are. They're getting there nice and rolly and squiggly. All right. So what we've got here, look at that. I've got a nice earthworm. Whoa, there we are. You can see I'm using different equipment this morning. And he's cold because it's really the middle of winter here in Australia. So he was crawling around one of my mulch pits this morning. And you and I live in a world in which the evolutionist thinks worms are simple. Well, I guess compared to you and I and Richard Dawkins, they really are simple. Um, I mean, they're just a burrowing stomach, aren't they? They dig their hole through the, the dirt simply by eating it all and passing the dirt out, and they take the, the food out of the dirt as it goes through. And even Charles Darwin, I mean, bless his heart, he did some good stuff because he studied earthworms. And part of our understanding of why earthworms are so vital to the gardens, you can say, thank you, Mr. Charles Darwin. I guess the ordinary farmer knows that well today. You want your plants to grow, then the plants won't grow without earthworms. Oh, but you see, you and I, Perhaps need to go one step further. There's our little earthworm. Um, I'm going to go to the other end. You see, I've got over here my toaster. You see, I've got a slice of bread. I'm just going to pop that in there and we'll press it a little later. Because in order to move from our watch to our worm, we need to go via the toaster. Uh, what do I mean? There, you know how Jesus used to use a lot of object lessons? That's what you're getting on a grand scale this morning, an argument, a lesson on biological creation that's using, well, stuff that's not alive. Oh, this stuff was made from living things, so we're meeting, meeting our argument halfway here in order to get to our worm and our dinosaur. <clears throat> okay, so we've got a bit of bread, we've got it in the toaster, we've got the worm over there. And I'm going to try and help you a bit because you should be able to do this. Most of you got a toaster. So boomerangs, you might not have. Worms, yeah, you might not even go out in the garden like I do. But you've got a toaster. Question, what do you need to make a toaster? Because we want to move to what do you need to make a worm? And then what do you need to make a dinosaur and to blow the whole evolutionary chance and time and energy can make life? Blow it out of the water. No apologies. That is where we're going to. That's why we won that debate against four professors at once. That's why we've done so well in debates by simply sticking to the truth of what you can actually observe in real life. Okay. Um, what do you need to make a toast? Oh, it's got metal in it. Great stuff. Metal doesn't toast your bread. I know when I was a kid, we didn't have electricity. Yep, Australia... <laughs> Australia was the wild frontier, and much of it still pretty is. We would fold up some wire, stick it through the bread, and roast it over the fire. Yummy on a cold winter's night. That was delicious. So we didn't need a toaster, but these are much easier to use. So what do you need to make a toaster? Metal. And you have little bits of metal that are so thin they will hook up when you pass electricity through it. So we need the metal, and we need the electricity. 
but actually, what do you need to make electricity? Don't you need one of those generators? I mean, I've got no power on at the house this morning, and so we always have an electrical generator. Uh, it doesn't work too well on, on Facebook or YouTube because everything goes in pulses. Uh, so we shifted houses this morning. So when you have a look, we need a toaster, we need metal, we need electricity. For the electricity, we need an electrical generator. For that, we need someone to invent one, which brings me to my friend Michael Faraday. Have you ever read up about him? I mean, he spent more time teaching Sunday school as a famous scientist than he ever did worrying about where his papers were going. A brilliant, self-taught inventor, the guy who made the electricity generator. Okay. And the interesting thing was he discovered by turning magnets and wires, it would actually give off energy. And he invented the electricity generator before there were toasters. He invented the electricity generator before anybody had anything to use electricity for. You know that old statement, um, necessity is the mother of invention? Well, he reversed it. His invention became the mother of necessity. We know that because the British Prime Minister, who was very anti-science in his day, actually visited him. And, and he said, now, Mr Faraday, pray tell, what will you use this electricity generator for? And Michael Faraday, in his simple Christian wisdom, said, I don't know, Mr Prime Minister, but I do know one thing. What's that, Mr Faraday? One day, you politicians will find a reason to tax it. See, wisdom comes from above. And now they do. You pay probably 50% of the price of this in taxes. But you see, in order to have the electricity generator, you need the metal copper. In order to have the metal copper, somebody has to dig it up. In order to dig it up, you can't just dig up a slab of copper because I found native copper. Uh, you need to be able to press it into wires, bang it, hammer it. And then you need to be able to roll it up in cores and find my, you know, magnet, magnets and all that sort of stuff. Man, this is getting rather complicated all to toast a piece of bread. You never thought about how much is involved. Or then someone has to design this and you pay for this toaster because somebody behind the scenes, somebody who's not a part of it and somebody who's smarter than it took their brains and added the information in their heads to the copper wire, to the thin wire inside, to the actual button that I'm going to press right there. And the electricity comes through here, turns the light on, and begins to cook our bread. Hopefully, it will pop up shortly. Now, think carefully. Oh, I only gave you part of the picture. You see, we didn't even ask where do we get the bread from. Because in order to have a toaster, we've already discovered we needed a copper mine. Therefore, someone needs a pick that's made out of non-copper that will break into other rocks. Somebody needs a furnace. They need to smelt. They need to make alloys, so they need weights and scales because you can't just make this metal out of any old combination. The alloys need precise measurements. Don't be surprised you read about metal alloys in Genesis chapter 4. We were at our smartest just after creation. Even though sin came in, in Genesis chapter 4, you read that Adam's sons and grandsons invented metal alloys. They designed metal instruments, you know, guitars and things like that. They invented metal tools. Yeah, and sadly, they invented weapons, which they would then proceed to kill each other with too. The real history of the world is the opposite of evolution. We start at the top and we plumb it down to the Stone Age. We don't start at the bottom and move up to the toaster age at all. The opposite is true. Come on, be honest. Most of you couldn't even make a toaster. You couldn't even make an electricity generator. All you know is how to switch one on. Okay. Oh, it's nice and warm in here in the middle of winter. Wonder what it's going to do next. But you see, in order to get our toaster, we have hundreds and hundreds of steps, hundreds and hundreds of things that you never see happening. And this is something that isn't alive. What do you need to make a worm? Oh, exposed to the cold. Look, it's just about cemented onto our plastic plate here. It's pretty cold in Australia. I've even got a tiny heater on under my desk here to keep this Australian alive and warm. We Aussies, we're not very good with the cold. Although once I did fall through the ice in Alaska on a, on, a, on a coal expedition, man, I'll tell you what, I don't like all that coal. And neither does my bread in the toaster. Uh, it's going to pop up soon. And what will you do with it then? Well, the interesting thing is, in order to have a toaster, you know, well, let's just push one here. Oh, look at that. A nice bit of toast. Mm. I'll tell you what, nothing better than an object lesson, is there? 
Oh, the toast is lovely. It'd be very nice if I had some jam on, but not even jam happens by itself. But have you ever asked, what do you need to get bread? Oh, you say, you need a supermarket. No, skip that step. That's not where we got bread from in the first place. We get it from the farmer. And the farmer, well, I bought some grains in here. You can make lovely bread with all these grains. There we are. Let's see if I can balance this in the right spot. Hmm. But in order to get the grains, you actually need the farmer to plant the seed. And the seed comes up and it has lovely heads of grain, wheats and corns and all those things you can put in breads. And you need a crasher to, gr to grind it up. Man, isn't this picture getting complicated of what you need to make a toaster? And it's not a living thing. But you see, the bread did come from a living thing. And when you have a look at the grain, well, one thing I've noticed around the globe is the people in the city find it so easy to leave God out of the picture. The kids think chickens grow in freezers. Milk comes in plastic bottles. They don't even consider a farmer needs to have a cow and needs to learn how to milk it. They, they have an oversimplified view. No wonder evolution fools them. Um, design things seem to them to happen by accident. They grow up that way. But out on the farm, down on the farm, the farmer plants his seed of wheat. It grows up. If it's a good grain, it will bring forth a hundredfold. Jesus used that analogy. It's a good one. But the farmer knows one thing. Out in the farmland, outside the city, where you observe the cows giving birth, where you know the cows have to eat grass in order to produce meat, where you know you need the rain, <coughs> the people are a lot more affiliated to believing God is in charge. You know, in our recent droughts in Australia, we have very few politicians who'll say, let us pray. They should, because the Bible is emphatic that God, the creator, the intelligent designer of all life, including the grain, is the one who actually controls the weather. I know we've got climate change and all that sort of political nonsense uh, designed to usurp power and remove God out of the picture. But you and I need to put this into the picture. In order to have the toast, we have to have the bread. In order to have the bread, we have to have the bakery. In order to have the bakery, we have to have the farmer who's planted the grain in the first place. You know, it doesn't stop there. That brings us to our worm. Uh, that's where we started. I went to my garden today. I grow corn. I, I grow wheat. I grow all sorts of things for my chickens. And what's interesting, of course, is that I, I, I grow worms deliberately at Jurassic Ark, our outdoor museum. If you're in Australia... And I don't know how they did it. We've got a couple of people from Florida this week who are in Australia. They're going to come to Jurassic Ark. And we got our gardens growing. They're magnificent now. Uh, we have forests and everything. We have the world's best biblical botanic gardens from Adam to Australia. You want to come sometime. But you know how we got it going? Raw sandstone and clay plus mulch did nothing until we added worms. And then the work of Charles Darwin gives you a real insight. The worm comes up, eats the mulch, takes it down, and you get a whole recycling of organic stuff in the ground. You want to grow a good crop of wheat? You need all those hidden things. The, the visible ones like the, the worms that you can dig up, but inside of them, I mean, they've got bacteria inside that help them actually digest the stuff and turn it back into worm pellets that will actually enable you to uh, grow your food. Uh, how complicated do you want to get on this? Because I bought in some dinosaur fossils. Oh, because that's where we want to finish. When you have a think about these creatures and you still haven't asked, how long do you need to make a worm or what do you need to make a dinosaur? You see, there's one other aspect of this before we throw it open to questions this morning. And that is, you live in a world where even theologians say, it doesn't matter how long God took to make the universe. Trouble is, the Bible says God has stamped his nature on the creation and it betrays the fact that he didn't take millions of years to make. In fact, the way he's made life makes it impossible for him to take millions of years to create something. I mean, think carefully. In order to plant the wheat, you already need the worms. In order to have the worms, you already need the dirt. In order to have the dirt, you already need the planet. But the planet can't be any size. If it's too big, the worm gets squashed. If it's too little, the worm floats away. The planet has to be just right. It has to be about the size of planet Earth. And nothing will work unless you've already got water. 
And in fact, you all have to have it there. And if you haven't got it in there within a few days, nothing will survive at all. Or haven't they ever let you think that way at school? You see our little formula, matter plus time plus energy plus intelligent design brings to light a very important economic principle. You've heard it at school, time is money. Yep. You want to make a career out of that? Then invent new processes that take less time to do something. Time is money, therefore money is time. The less time you take, the more money you can get a very solid and proven principle over and over again. But you see, if you want to make life, time is your biggest enemy. Uh, last illustration today. Remember our question, how long have you got to make a dinosaur? Why did I bring this piece of petrified polished poo? Reason, see these little white spots there? We know what they are. They're um, fossilised dung beetle burrows. Dung beetles, yep. Yeah. We have them in Australia. You have them in America. You have them in England. And every night, particularly the black ones, will come out and don't they clean up cow droppings and things like that? That's what they do in Australia. They come up and they look around and they say, oh, another yummy big brown one. If you've ever wondered if God's got a sense of humour, he sure does, right? He'd invent a creature that would eat poo. And in fact, don't they roll it up and take it back to their girlfriend and say, here, darling, marry me? They do. So God's got a great sense of humour. Don't be one of those killjoys who sits in a church pew and groans at everything happening on the planet. Get out there and share the joy of the real creator who happens to be, by the way, Jesus Christ. Okay, so how long have you got to make a dinosaur? Because the theory of evolution says over billions of years, chemicals all by themselves can turn into organic chemicals, which can turn into cells, which can turn into worms, which can turn into ultimately, 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 after millions and millions of years, they'll turn into dinosaurs. And the reason they're not here now is they grew feathers and turned into chickens. Isn't that the story in the school textbooks? And not once do they ask them, what's the role of time in this? How vital is time? Well, a little piece of petrified polished poo is going to tell you that because these holes, these white bits here, they're dung beetle burrows. And all the fossil evidence tells us dung beetles, which today are about that big, and they roll up the ball of poo and take it back, they have never been any bigger. Or worms, we've got worms in Australia like this, and fossil worms, which are even bigger. We've got giant, giant kangaroos. I've dug up giant kangaroos twice the size of me. Man, how would you live in a world like that? And there was dinosaurs, humongous things. And even the little things, like, you know, there are amoebas in the rocks that you can actually see. And the pyramids are, are made of nummelites that today, are, well, you can't even see the space between my fingers. You see them in the rocks and you can visibly see the fossil nummelites in, in, in the rocks of the pyramids. Quite amazing. The world used to be a bigger and grander place. How long have we got to make a dinosaur? Well, the dung beetles are our help here. You see, if you're a creature, and I only bought my little skull this morning. I've got car skulls of all sorts that we use at Jurassic Ark and in schools. And yes, they're all made of student defensive material that they can't break because accidents ruin everything, including life. Mutations do not benefit you at all. Um, they destroy you. They're no help even with natural selection. Um, I'll tell you what, when you look at our dinosaur here, think carefully. What do you need to actually keep it alive? Answer is food. Um, that's how we know what they ate. When we dig up their poo, like there's a nice bit of polished poo and it's got all sorts of colours and you can put it in a microscope and you'll find out what they ate. But if you're one of these critters and you're, say, 60 feet, 20 metres long, you need basically a tonne of food per metre, say the experts. Now, if you have a tonne coming in this end, guess how much you have coming out that end? Ah, oh, I know you don't have lessons on pieces of poo, but dinosaur poo sometimes... The poo is like that. I can't even put my hands on the screen there. The biggest bit is nearly two metres long. Man, that's a lot of poop, isn't it? And the interesting thing is the same God who invented this end of the dinosaur takes credit. I mean, all things are made by Jesus Christ. We make no apologies through SFT or at Creation Research for telling people nothing happened by itself. Jesus Christ created everything, including coronavirus. You might want to take that up in question time sometime. And he knew what the other end needed, just he knew what this end needed. But let's concentrate 
on this head. You see, the poo that's got dung beetle burrows in it is a clue to how clever and how little time you've got to actually make dinosaurs or make anything living. Okay, you're 60 foot long. You plop two tons a day. You eat two tons a day. You eat five tons a day. You plop an awful lot. Within six months, you'd be in it right up to your eyeballs and you'd drown. You'd die out. So the same guy who invented the monster at one end invented the midget at the other that would actually be able to remove it, recycle it. Oh, hang on. I've got an interesting problem here because many of the dung beetles you never see because many of them come out at night. Now, when you're smaller than a blade of grass, you have to have some inbuilt things to help you find dung. Oh, it's easy when you come out of your burrow, you go, I mean, even you can do that. You step in it and you know exactly what you've stepped into. Your nose tells you. Same with a dung beetle. So it can find the poo uh, coming out of the burrow even in the dark. But then when you're smaller than the blade of grass, how do you find your way home? You know what we've discovered? Let me summarise it. Uh, you will find that the dung beetle actually uses east and west because even quite a few hours after sunset, the sky in the west will still glow. The dung beetle uses the, 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 the constellations. He can read the stars. Well, he's got a, a method that tells him which way the stars are going, and he can actually read the gradient, gradient of the light and, 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 and the polarisation of the light. You say, how would you know that? The dung beetle, you can't run experiments on dung beetles. Well, actually, we do. We do. I mean, it's simple, really. Sometimes being a, a scientist is a lot of macabre fun. You know, you, you get out there and you fool the dung beetles. They come out at night. You actually take a picture of the sky. And as they are moving across the, the ground, you let your camera roll and you get a picture of the sky, which when it reaches the poo, you then project onto the sky, an artificial sky that you put there and shift it. So instead of the Southern Cross being there, it's now there. And you realise doing this time and time again tells us the constellations tells them where they are. The solar uh, light tells them where we are. The leftover remnant light from the sunset tells them where they are and many other celestial things. And if you twist the Southern Cross, they never find their way home. Okay, let's make this point very simple. To have a dinosaur, you need a dung beetle. But to have a dung beetle... You don't just need grass that gives the dinosaur droppings or remnants that the dung beetle could live on. In order to have a dung beetle, you need a universe because it finds its way at night by the constellations. No constellations, dung beetle can't ever find its way back home. You ever realise that even the tiniest thing tells you one thing? In order to have the big monsters, you have to have the dung beetles and the universe finished within six days or you ain't got nothing that'll work at all i mean try it you want to make a car cars are no use to you discover petrol ah oh, never thought of that in fact when you have a look at your toaster toasters are no use until you have someone who invents electricity it doesn't happen by itself even the piece of toast that's no use you can have your light bread you can have your dark bread but they are no use until the farmer actually can have his ground with the worms in it and the seed. And none of that's any use unless the planet is just the right size and the rain comes and all of those things you'll read about in Genesis chapter 1. Can I encourage you? We've given you a summary of, of what we've been doing. Last year when coronavirus struck and all our ministry just went down the tubes, which it has now, by the way, uh, I'm supposed to be in other states right at this moment, that everything is locked down in Australia. So pray the Lord might raise up alternative meetings here in Queensland where we seem to be stuck for the next six weeks. But last year when the same thing happened, we did that series. We put it on our MP4s and MP3s. So if you want to get it, look for the search for the origin life, the search for creation, creation, the final proof, etc. And they're available as video downloads now. I'd encourage you, it will give you the longer version. I think there's 12 lessons there. And if you're a teacher, you'll find it very, very helpful because you will notice that I'm on a Christian program this morning, so we've actually thrown in some Bible verses. But you can actually reverse that and get the kids in the end to realise, hey, this couldn't happen by itself. 
How could it have got here? And then usually you're free to answer the question. It's a brilliant technique. Okay, guys, I think that's a good place to sort of launch up into questions. I'm going to grab a mouthful of water here. If you guys want to come back on screen. <laughs> You've earned that uh, mouthful of water, uh, John. As always, fantastic presentation. Another demonstration as to why naturalism and a rejection of God is indefensible and that we need to just trust our Bible and trust the account in Genesis. So great job, John. I want to let everybody know in the chat, we have a great chat, tons of great questions. Please check the description box for more on, um, on John and the creation research team. You'll find their websites, YouTube channels, as well as the playlist with all of their appearances on Standing for Truth. So that being said, we do have a lot of questions. And what I want to do, uh, John and George, is start with the ones that are most related to design in the topic and then we'll move towards uh, some of the questions we he have here on the flood and uh, young earth creation uh, george before we get into the questions though brother did you have any uh any comments or thoughts yeah um th thanks uh th thanks tony um john thank you very much again for coming uh to our show uh look uh, i woke up at five o'clock this morning and uh, I just want to tell the audience, if you're looking at concise three-minute reads of specific subjects on evolution or whatever, go to the creation research fact file, type in a subject, you'll get a number of articles you can read, and they're all short, short and concise. I mean, I've got nothing against IOG or CMI or ICR, but some, some of those are fairly lengthy. So, yeah, I just want to plug that for, for John because they're a great piece of resource if you haven't got a lot of time to read. And, and um, also, George, the, the links to longer articles are there from the same one. So we correct. deliberately know that a world is absolutely rushed off its feet. We've got time to eyeball things today. So we design them so they're readable within three minutes and you yeah. can pursue it further if you need to. But they make great single simple points to communicate to others uh, i love i love one sentence that i read uh, in one of those articles john you said the two words in quotes directed and evolution are together an oxymoron i love That's it true. <laughs> That's exactly true. all right well well right. said uh george and all those links are in the description box so please check out uh uh, the creation research team. So that being said, let's go to the first question. Question from Jim P. I appreciate the question, Jim. So his question is, evolutionists claim to observe bad design. For example, the human spine or eye is not optimized for function. What are your thoughts on that, John? Okay. Let's take my Kentucky students where I first did this experiment. And yes, we had access to all the state schools in southern Kentucky. We did this a lot of times. Now, when the students first look, I pass them around, right? They all had the opportunity to observe the boomerang, and then they actually made a boomerang that didn't come back. Uh, I took theirs and I said, look, this won't come back. I said, in Australia, a boomerang won't come back. We called it a stick, and you bet the, the dog for it, right? <laughs> and the trouble was none of their boomerangs happened by accident but they were all bad designs. Now, there's point number one. Even a bad design is the result of a designer. So forget your nonsense, Richard Dawkins and David Attenborough. You're going to complain about the design, then you need to complain about, hey, I'm lying to you about there being no evidence for design. A bad design actually resulted from a designer. Okay, now come one step further. If you want to see everything, one of the phrases I've become famous for or infamous for is you need to see things God's way. You need to put biblical glasses on. And here's the news we don't want to hear. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. No dispute. Anybody who reads Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, can actually see that. And then the time you get to chapter 2, it talks about God taking dust and making man, and then taking from the man's side, putting him to sleep, and making a woman. So neither the man nor the woman got here by accident. They were deliberately and intelligently designed. Then the last verse says, everything was made very good. So the moral of the story is, you don't live in that world anymore. 
please don't blame God for bad things because when he left it to our care, it was in perfect shape. Genesis chapter 3, the Bible is emphatic that man disobeyed God and in doing so, we broke his rules and he warned us the wages of sin would be death. Now, from that time onwards, things the Bible records have gone downhill. So you will find that even in the, in the Bible, there's Leah, you know, one of the popular wives in the Bible back there, and she is the first person ever recorded as being short-sighted. Something had gone wrong. But the reason we know she was short-sighted is that some people still had good sight. Now, you notice I don't usually wear glasses. My eyes are pretty good for someone who's sort of 74 years age. Uh, I mean, I'm turning into a dinosaur, according to my children and my grandchildren. <laughs> but in reality, there have to be some good parts about my design which have done wonderfully. But there's also been some bad parts that I've struggled with. I was born with pyloric stenosis. Now, you don't want it. Uh, you mightn't even know anybody who's had it. But when you are born, there's a little sphincter, a little sort of gateway that locks your stomach, stops you swallowing all the liquid in mum, right? And, and, and if that doesn't open, you can't even swallow the milk from mum. You are in serious trouble on death's downhill slide. Can I complain? Well, no, the Bible says we sin. God warned us that the wages of sin would be death, and I was on the road to death. Okay, now the doctors tried an experimental treatment on me. Praise God, it worked. They have to force this muscle to open and stay open. And by the size of me now, you'll know it's actually worked. I had to laugh. I went and saw the doctor many years later and he said, you know, when you were first born, I, I looked after your mum and he said, I was sure that you'd always be stunted. I'd hate to see what size would you be if you were normal. Uh, <laughs> so in reality, you will find that, that that problem was solved by an intelligent designer. Most of you haven't heard of this problem because you don't have it. I can't blame God for it. I can blame sin for it. Okay, sin has caused things to go downhill. Sin has sometimes deliberately caused it to go downhill. So many of the Nazi doctors deliberately experimented to make things happen badly and go downhill. Okay, and we're looking at things like that that are being done in the world today. So please don't blame God for bad things. That's the bit that Richard Dawkins, David Attenborough, and all the evolutionists don't want to hear. They think because they've got poor sight, you've got to blame God for inventing sight. Now, God invented sight, and it was beautiful. That's why you've got glasses, Richard, and I don't. Um, <laughs> that's how it goes. So that's the best way of dealing with that. Fantastic response, uh, John. I really appreciate that. As always, we love how informative you are with these uh, with these answers. They're a huge help. So here's a question. Um, John, that I want to get to. It's a question that came in from a skeptic of the young earth creation and global flood model. The question is, how could any vegetarian, and in brackets, um, he put trees, bushes, and grass, survive being submerged or even destroyed by salinated water? Okay, it is a good question, and it's one that I asked in the middle of the desert of Western Australia. Um, you see, my background is geology. Uh, I went and did three years of genetics as well. I'd grown up with a dad who loved gardening. My first gardening book, even as a non-Christian, was the old Yates Gardening Guide. Some of you may remember that it started with man was made to live in a garden. And I thought, that's a wonderful idea. Later on, I discovered it straight from Genesis because God made a garden and he put the man in it. So man was made to live in a garden. But that didn't help me figure out how does a gum tree survive a flood? We're here in Australia. We're noted for gum trees because, A, they can actually send their roots down and find the water. But, B, if you flood the earth, this dry land plant, how does it cope? So I had an opportunity. I was with the head of the agricultural section in forestry, and I asked him, I said, see that, that gum tree over there? Um, how does it actually survive? How would it actually survive a flood that went not just 40 days, but over 364 days, plus a few extras, right? And uh, he said, well, simple, actually. He says, the same way they do now. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, built into the tree, and we don't know why, but every now and then in Australia, we have a year where there's a massive rainfall. 
Some of you may have read up on Jurassic Arc. Back in 2011, we had 16 inches of rain, 400 millimetres in four hours. It overwhelmed everything. And now we've got the opposite. We've got a drought. Now, the gum trees live through both. And I'm out in the desert, and this guy said, well, look, come and have a look at this. He said, this tree grows in this pan. He said, this is a little lake bed in wet seasons. The gum tree stays alive. And he said, sometimes the lake gets so deep, the gum tree should drown. But he said, here's what we've observed. They have a mechanism to turn themselves off. And he says, as soon as the water level gets to the right, you know, humidity, they turn themselves back on again. Now, I had my students, after that conversation, I had my students run Charles Darwin's experiment for seven years to see if those sort of statements held up. What experiment? Well, Charles Darwin still got bottles in the basement of the university uh, in which he collected seeds, dry land plant seeds, wetland plant seeds, grass seeds, vegetable seeds, etc., and he put them in a bottle, filled it up with water. And then every week they would take one out and they would plant them to see what survived. Here's the general results you got. And by the way, I got exactly the same results in my students for seven years in a row. So feel free to try and disprove it. You're not going not to be successful. Domestic plants, corn, wheat, peas, all the things that Noah would have taken on the ark as feed for himself, um, they don't survive very well underwater. You put them in water, you end up with pea beer, right? It ferments. They don't do well underwater at all. But all your grass seeds, all of the wild plants, they survive like crazy. I mean, we see it in the real world out here. We have dams. We build massive dams in Australia compared to many countries. And what you find is you flood the dam. The dam will be underwater for 25 years. Then there'll be a mega drought and it will dry out. And instantly the grass comes back up. Now the seed has been there for 10, 20, 30 years. Um, it's not affected by the water at all. So as much as the question seems impossible, when you test this real world, you find that the sort of plants that Noah would have taken on board for food actually need to be on board for food. The sort of plants that are going to be outside the ark anyway, the wild animal food, the vegetarian stuff, no trouble at all. It survives now under, underwater at all. And by the way, you have an assumption when you say it was flooded with salt water. Hmm. Uh, we, we do have salt water we dig out of the ground with bores and we can supply it to most of the plants. Um, they, do, they don't seem to struggle too much with it here in Australia. But if you assume all the floodwaters were salt water, you are assuming too much. Here's your assumption. Whatever the sea is like now, it's always been. Charles Lyell's principle of uniformitarianism. Uh, don't assume that the present is the key to the past. When God made the world, it was very good and there would have been just enough minerals in the water to do the best for all the fishes that they ever could do. Uh, that's why many saltwater fishes can move into fresh water and vice versa. Uh, and year by year, the amount of salt is actually increasing in the sea. Can you get it? Hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. In the last days, a third of the sea will die. That's the inevitable result, which means one thing. When God made the world, he knew how it could end. Interesting thought. I got to say, uh, John, again, great answer to a common question, a good question with a, a solid answer. I find even the best so-called objections to a young earth and a global flood have uh, very good answers ready to uh, ready to go, as, as you've um demonstrated here john uh george did you have any comments or anything brother before we get to the next next question yeah I, i'd just like to confirm what john uh, had mentioned um one day when you come up to my lake house john i'll uh i'll show you exactly what uh you were saying about the water the water level of the lake when it drops in those drought years the banks it's amazing how quickly they come up with vegetation the wattle trees the grass the weeds they'll come up and the other thing, of course, after the flood, the soils and the materials would have been rich in mineral minerals, perfect sort of composition for seeds to grow in. Uh, yeah. One other thing I might throw in there, now that I've been a gardener for many, many decades, here's what I've observed. There are some plants 
that if you submerse them underwater, the first thing they begin to do is swell. They take a certain amount of water in and then they form on the outside an impenetrable barrier. They lock themselves in. It's built into the sea and that barrier will begin to disintegrate as soon as the humidity outside the, search of the, the seed in the ground gets below a certain point, then they'll germinate. So they have an inbuilt mechanism to cope with the right amount and the wrong amount of water. So intelligent design, way above the normal level we're used to thinking about. <laughs> and these inbuilt mechanisms that we frequently talk about, mm -hmm. they are evidence of forward thinking, which points us back to the forward thinker. Um, yeah. So those are some great points. And, and as you uh, pointed out, John, correct me if I'm wrong, Darwin himself, Charles Darwin himself, helped us with this answer yeah. through his experience. Yeah, got to give credit where credit is due. Yeah. St <laughs> St Standing, there's, there's another Australian, I think it's the bottle brush. Uh, John, doesn't it uh, rely on a bushfire to actually germinate? It does. Uh, there's two ways you can take this. One is that it's adapted to actually become fire resistant. But the real history of the plant is that you have a plant which all the non-fire resistant ones have been eliminated to the point where the seed has got such a thick coat on it, a fire is needed. So it's become mm -hmm. degenerate dependent. Right? So it's not an example of creation per se, but it is an example of forward planning to a world which you would have terrible conditions like we have in Australia six years out of ten. Yeah, and evolution doesn't do any forward planning, does it? No, it doesn't do any forward planning. No brains. Yeah. Oh, you're muted, Donny. You're muted. <laughs> there we go. I apologize. And I was just pointing out uh, um, exactly right. The evolutionist would then have to give evolutionary processes like selection and mutations a mind, which we know uh, they do not have. So great points. And I have a question here from uh, Andrew Cumming and the chat's lively and the comments are coming in like crazy. So unfortunately I can't put it up on screen, but I will read it here word for word. Uh, so question for John Mackay, how does intelligent design explain the biological nested hierarchy? In particular, why are tuna more similar in anatomy to humans than to other aquatic species like sharks. Okay, well, just to give my brain 30 seconds to think through some of those big words, um, I'm gonna sneak in a commercial here about Jurassic Ark. If you haven't yet got some of our books, try that one. It deals with a lot of our experiments and our fossils, which are all relevant to that stuff we've been doing today. And we've designed every experiment. So you can think it through to see here's our aim, Here's the design, here's the intelligence that went into it, here's the results, and here's the proof of all things that, that God said we, we are to do. And so when you look at this question about the hierarchy, I say tuna more similar to us uh, than sharks are, you have to get the bigger picture. Um, one reason I did three years at the at Queensland University is very simple. As a geologist, you are used to digging up dead things. Um, you want to know about the origin of life and you want to know about how it works? Geology is not much help. Uh, dead things aren't living. Uh, evolution is an active process. You don't see it in the fossils. That's why Darwin said the fossils are the worst aspect of my theory. That's why your first fossil tuna looks like a tuna. That's why your first fossil shark. And we have fossil sharks in coal fields, which is my specialty, right? And, and they don't look any different. There's no help from the fossils. So the ascendancy that the type of hierarchy you find in the fishes in living ones is apparently there in the fossil record, staring them in the face, same then as it is now. Um, but you need to throw in some living biology. I always enjoy doing human anatomy and then asking questions like, how come if we want to use a valve to you know, put in a, a human being, uh, how come we use pig valves um, and not monkey valves? Now, the reason is simple. Pigs are more like people. But then observation should tell you that, shouldn't it? Um, if you want to study the stomach, study a pig's stomach. People eat like pigs. It's really true. 
And so you'll find this ascendancy, um, a hierarchy there is an arbitrary one. You could pick pigs, you could pick tuna, and it doesn't help you one way or the other once you realize the first fossil pigs, hey, I'll tell you what, I've seen a fossil pig and it was 12 feet long. They used to be monsters. But pigs they is and pigs they are and pigs they always have been right from the start. Same as the fishes. I've got thousands of fossil fishes in my collection. Come and see us at Jurassic Ark sometime. We've got them so well preserved, their guts are still intact. So you can study the similarity of sharks and tuna and human beings and notice that, hey, this has got seven points in common with me. This has got four points in common. I can arrange that in a hierarchy. But you end up with the same problem that the ancient Greeks had when they tried to organize things into a hierarchy. It's the result of your mind imposing rules on the creation. It's not a result of how the creation actually runs at all, particularly in a world, uh, remember carefully, think carefully back to the beginning. In the beginning, God created all the creatures, ate plants, gold tail out of. That included our sharks. Oh, I know it's so hard to think of sharp teeth. Why would they eat plants? Big kelp. You can't tear up big kelp without sharp teeth. Or you perhaps need to think that one through. So the hierarchy is artificial and the result of your mind imposed upon the data, not of the data arranging itself till it smacks you in the face. Great response, John. Great response. Um, and to a common objection, too. And, and I like to point out that there's no surprise, according to the design model, that God would have created some creatures more similar to each other, like humans and chimpanzees, and other creatures less similar, like humans and dogs. So there's this natural nested hierarchy um, that seems to just be uh, agnostic to the debate to begin with. Um, I want to I want to get this question in here because this came in the form of a super chat. So I appreciate the the support from Smoky Saint. So the uh, the question for you, John, is what is the response to the amount of bio deposits from the flood would have been many times greater than the life on Earth at one time? All right, a common objection out there by the skeptic who uses the present day world as his model. So Professor Ian Plymer, one of my big enemies when it comes to uh, um, the flood and creation and all of that. But we're actually on the same size when it comes to climate change, right? Because he says from geology, the evidence shows that climate's gone up and down over history. And I say exactly the same, except we've had a much smaller time scale. So when you look at him, he said that to, to me many, many years ago. We have 40 times the amount of coal and oil that we could ever get in the in, in a Noah's flood. Of course, his presumption is that the amount of arable land today is exactly what it was back in the biblical time of Noah's flood. Okay, perspective. In the world today, you have seven seas. Sometimes they make it eight, right? But say say this, the, the main, main land masses are separated by seven to eight ocean spaces, and you'll find that the world is no more than 25% land, 75% water. Now, in that 25%, maybe no more than 10 to 15% is arable, and only some of that is covered with lush vegetation that would be suitable for making massive biodeposits, right? So at that level, the argument is a valid one. But if you put the biblical glasses on, go back to Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 1, it says God raised up the dry land and the water came off it and he called the dry land earth and all the water formed the sea. It ran into the sea. Okay. Now, I went to a Hebrew linguist because I'm not, right? I can read bits of Hebrew, I can read the concordance, I can read the analytical uh, analysis of the language and all of that, but I, I'm no expert in that. So I went to a professor of Middle Eastern semantics, you know, the ancient uh, languages of the Middle East, and I said, when it says God gathered the earth into one place and he put the rest of the, uh, gather the water into one place and the rest of it was raised up as dry land, what does it mean? He said, well, that's to give you a sense of the fact that there was more land than there was water. It was the water that was in one place. If there was more water than land, it would be the land that was in one place. 
right? You're catching the mathematical concept that's there. So he put all the water into one place and he called the dry land earth and he called the gathered together waters seas. Okay, so the water is in one place. Most of the earth is covered with dry land, three quarters at least, and it's the reverse of the present. But yet what's different about that? By the time you get to Noah's flood, you know, number one, there's no rain. Every day, the whole surface of the earth from North Pole to South Pole is watered by a mist. There's no winter, so there's no ice at the poles. There's no summer, so there's no deserts and no drought. So instead of having 10 to 15% of 25% of the earth covered with arable ground, you've now got 100% of 75% of the earth covered with beautiful, luxurious growth. Sit down and do your maths. Plenty of vegetation, plenty of biomatter to make every deposit we've got on the planet. So put your biblical glasses on. In fact, have a look at our Jurassic Ark experiments. If you go to creationresearch.net, click on the research, click on the experiments, and have a look at some of the stuff we're doing, rapidly generating biological deposits. Johnny, if I can add something to that. Mm -hmm. uh, with, uh, with this climate change business, they, they have measured a, an increase in carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. And as a result, and you can actually check this yourself on the NASA website, they've actually observed the, the, the earth itself increasing, uh, sorry, greening. It's, it's, it's increasing in greening. So, and they also observed the increase in carbon dioxide assist plants by the fact that they don't need as much water. Mm -hmm. So a couple of those things, what you said, the increase in carbon dioxide, less water, you'd get a lot of growth. Uh, and the, the entire earth would have been green and probably luscious. And I, I can just imagine, you know, the Queensland forests, probably similar to that, maybe multiple times larger. Right. Yes, no doubt about that. Like one of my friends was in the Kalahari one year as the amount of CO2 is measured is rising. And what you can actually see, even on the satellite maps, because I downloaded them, you can watch the desert getting greener without yes. any rain falling at all. And he was there and photographed it for me, right? So I have all the photographic evidence of exactly what was happening. And what you say is absolutely true. Go to our fact file, the one you recommended before, and on the fact file search engine, put in climate, put in greening, put in any of those, and you get those nice little bite-sized ones you can actually make great use of. Yeah, like on your fire and ice video with uh, Iceland, I believe, uh, you know, there was, at one stage they had, um, they were cultivating uh, crops like corns and wheats and stuff. So the, the, the uniformity... Yeah, the uniformitarian idea is really dead, really. I mean, I've heard a few evolutionists have thrown Lyell under the bus and they're now, they're now accepting catastrophism. Yeah, they want catastrophism without a creator. They want catastrophism without the Bible being true. And the video you recommended, the fire and ice one, that is available as an MP4. So get to see what Joseph, we just don't talk about it like, uh, you know, like just having a chat show here. Joseph went to Iceland, filmed it all, and uh, you actually enjoy seeing the actual on-the-spot documentary stuff uh, from a program called Fire and Ice, available creation research. It's in the index that they put up and click to our MP4s. And also, um, John, I've, I've been posting uh, the links to several of your uh, must-watch debates, a few of them that I've watched in the uh, in the live chat for people to check out. For example, uh, your debate with Professor John Turner, that mm -hmm. was a must-watch. I really enjoyed that. I believe Joseph moderated that, if I'm if I'm correct, as well of of course as your uh, famous uh, discussion with Richard Dawkins. So uh, to people in the chat, please check that out. Um, John, you are the undefeated champ, if, if I am to be uh, to give my opinion on those debates. Uh, that well, while you're thinking of that, I don't know if we have any Australian watchers except for George, but here down under, we have one urgent need, and that is our next six weeks has gone down the spout with COVID lockdown. So we need people who want meetings locally within Queensland where we're allowed to travel. So uh, if you're anyone out there watching, pray for us and uh, pray for any alternatives that might be raised up because six weeks of ministry is a giant slab. 
Absolutely, brother. Our, our prayers are always with you, uh, with you guys. Uh, you guys have been an incredible blessing. So I, I definitely want to cap this around the hour and 25 minute mark. So George, mm -hmm. if you wanted to pick um, yep. one of the, uh, the yep. several oh, questions we have left, we'll try and get through maybe two more and then kind of wind it down. Usually we uh, cap these at about an hour and a half. So uh, George, go ahead, uh, brother. Uh, no worries. Before I ask the question, John, there's a skeptic in the chat who uh, has taken a liking to the bookshelves in the background, says they're very nice. They really are. Um, <laughs> I, I have hundreds of books in my room too, but they're not in shelves that are as nice as this. And not one of them got there except by intelligent design and pre-existing thought, and they were all created. <laughs> so this, this, this is the question, This is the question, John. It's, it's by um, a member of the audience called Saved by Grace. Mm -hmm. uh, it says, how do you answer critics of creation that argue the God of the Bible wouldn't use junk DNA and the discovery of the so-called junk DNA proves God doesn't exist? All right. Um, a real life, I had a debate in New Zealand against a geneticist. He was the winner of their best genetics prize um, in, the, in the previous year or so. And he raised the same issue. Now, this is quite a few years ago before we discovered a lot more about junk DNA. And I said, be very careful about making statements that something doesn't do anything. Okay. It was one of those sort of statements that led to me becoming a Christian. By way of background, I was reading a book by an atheist scientist, and he basically said, there is no God. Now, philosophically, that's a silly statement. You cannot prove it. And he went on to launch his whole book based on that philosophical non-position. If there is no God, you can't prove it. At the best, you can be a agnostic. You might as well shut up about it because you can't prove either one. Okay, so you go on and you have an absolute negative, something that can't exist, won't exist, can't even be checked upon. You can disprove an absolute negative, either by becoming a Christian and finding Christ like I did, or by discovering the appendix does nothing. That was the statement he was majoring on. How could there be a God if the appendix does nothing? It must be left over. Well, since he made that statement, we've discovered 131 uses the last time I checked. It may even be more, many of which occur in the body before the baby is born, right? So we weren't even looking in the right place. So when you have a statement that says the appendix does nothing, junk DNA does nothing, be careful. Your very words out of your own mouth will judge you, just like they did that professor, that atheist, who said the appendix does nothing. Now we know he was talking through his nose and he wasn't using his brain at all. His brain should have said, hey, I can't prove this statement. At the best, we could record that people have said this, but it doesn't mean one thing. Now you know it's got 131 uses. How many more uses for junk DNA are we going to find? And I said this to Professor. And by the way, he literally fell off his chair. He'd never put the two together. And I mean literally fell off his chair because he moved backwards in shock and fell off the back of the stage. It was the funniest debate I've ever had. But uh, having said that, you will find that we are discovering more and more about junk DNA. And uh, I just got a paper yesterday sent to me, which I haven't had time to use for, and it talked about the role of junk DNA in causing a way it went to, to see. And many of them are turning out to be switches and things like that that don't actually have a function apart from turning something else off or turning it off. Okay, so that's where you want to go. Don't ever believe a statement that says something does nothing. It's a non-statement, a betrayal of your own ignorance. I got to say, John, before you go to the next question, George, I apologize. And, um, but uh, you are a jack of all trades, uh, John. I, I feel uh, sorry for any atheist that has to take you on because... I mean, you got an answer to the genetics questions, biology questions, geology questions. So you are a, a walking encyclopedia. And, and I really appreciate that, uh, John. That's a great answer. And one thing I'll add, too, is the fact that the uh, junk DNA paradigm is being overturned. As you've pointed out in previous presentations, John, most mutations are deleterious. Therefore, if most of the genome is, is functional, almost every mutation will then be damaging to an organism, which puts shelf lives on genomes. They can't be millions to billions of years old. I'll so say one more thing, one yeah. more thing that's in our 
a course on uh, search for the origin of life, etc., is when your DNA is folded, you know how it wraps up? It wraps up to protect itself, and on the outside is DNA, which can afford to be mutated. So the radiation coming in from the outside hits only the, you know, the, the stuff that it's not needed. So quite a bit of what's labelled junk DNA turns out to be my protection. I can let this mess around all you like, and it's got a function, but its function is to protect the really important DNA. So there's a function we've discovered of so much of junk DNA that's easy for most people to understand. Amen. Well said. Well said, brother. Uh, George, go ahead. Uh, yeah, John, uh, you, you'll recall I had a short conversation with you, I think, uh, yesterday or the day before about uh, this heat problem. And we talked about how, you know, whatever they've got is a hypothesis and whatever we have is also a hypothesis. But uh, this question relates to in part that particular scenario. Uh, the question says, is accelerated radioactive decay necessary in a young Earth creation model in order to account for the dates derived from dating methods? No, the exposure of people's arrogance is usually what's needed so that uh, you will discover that most of the so-called absolute dates, if you know enough about them, they're not the absolute date they pretend to be. So one quick visit to the files of Vanderbilt University by myself and one of the geologists in the in Tennessee Division of Geology, and we extracted for one bed we were looking at a whole pile of dates. Only this one is recorded. The ones that are too young are eliminated from the popular literature. The ones that are too old are buried as far as you can get it. So you don't need to worry about accelerated dating just simply the, the, the overwhelming arrogance of people who choose, pick and push the one date they want that fits their story. Um, so again, you don't need the dating. And secondly, you want to look up our strata machine experiments because the normal assumption of dating is the rock layers are older at the bottom and the younger at the top. Well, that it turns out to be fallacious. Rock layers like in the Grand Canyon, I had a professor and he said, I hate to tell you this, students, but the rocks in the Grand Canyon get old sideways. And the wretch never talked about it again in the next four years I was there. I thought, what did you mean? Well, I've been to the Grand Canyon many times, and he's absolutely right. The rocks don't get old from top to bottom. They're old on the left, and they're younger on the right. So the radioactive dates don't even match the real history of the rocks and the order of formation. So just forget it. Radioactivity is a great arbitrary story of a fallacious history that's just popular. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, without asking you another question, John, I've got a question to ask the audience, some of the skeptics in there. It's actually from your website. And I thought it was very, very good, actually. It says, why is it that only the duplicate gene gets mutated into something new and the original gene stays intact? If mutations were really random, both copies of the gene would be equally subject to mutation. Then you ask the question, does any evolutionist out there have an answer to this? So I want them to ponder that one. Not necessarily I want an answer to it now, but ponder that, ponder that. All right. Well, thank you, George and John. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pick out one final question. We're at the hour and 20 minute mark, and typically we wrap yep. these up at an hour and a half. So uh, time, as always, has flown by, John. I think you could tell that we could probably ask you questions all day because we really enjoy your informative answers. So the question, um, the last question for the day will be, uh, John, it has been said that carbon dating has dated samples older than 6,000 years and thus refuting the biblical time frame. What is a good response to these types of objections? Um, come with me to a carbon-14 lab, bring seven samples of dinosaur bone, and uh, see which one gives you a date that it shouldn't have. Right? So that's, in other words, you need to expose the fallacies of carbon-14 rather than just the positives that are presented in such glorious scientific magazines as Woman Weekly and Reader's Digest uh, for the general purpose to swallow. Um, so you will find that if you actually bring enough samples in, even diamond has carbon-14 in it. Shouldn't, it's supposed to be billions of years old. Dinosaur bones over and over again. 
not only have materials, you know, organic materials, tissues and that, they also have carbon-14 dates. And if the method worked, you should at the most get 70 or so thousand years. Um, it shouldn't date dinosaur bones, but it gives you a date. So the whole method is shot again by the Charles Lyell, Charles Darwin principle, whatever's happening now has always happened. And in reality, you'll find that if you have a dinosaur bone with no carbon-14 in it, then you should say, well, it existed in a world where there was no carbon-14. Not that it's 70,000 years old. It just came from a world where there was no radioactive carbon. Bless its heart, it would have done much better than we're doing at the moment. Because you go to a carbon-14 lab and it will say, wear your protective equipment. Carbon-14 is dangerous to your lungs particularly. So no help to the present day world. Amen. Well said, uh, John. You know, I have yet to see a real good answer as to why there are detectable levels of radiocarbon, as you pointed out, in samples, apparently millions to billions of years old in the case of, let's say, diamonds. Have you heard any uh, real satisfactory answer to, to this problem for deep time proponents or mostly just rescue devices, as we call it here on this channel? No, they, they don't have a response to that. Hence, they ignore the question and they deny the basis of the data, sadly. And yet they won't stop putting forth carbon dating type arguments to, to apparently refute a young earth. But as, as I think you're demonstrating here, uh, carbon dating is the young earth creationist's best friend. <laughs> it's almost a direct refutation of of an old earth. So I appreciate that answer to, uh, you know, the final question that we'll ask here, because I know you're so busy. And as always, I appreciate the time that you have given to us, um, John. Uh, I want to hand it to George, though. Did you have any uh, final thoughts pertaining to that question before we start wrapping it up here? Oh, yeah. Uh, I think we've spoken about this numerous times. I mean, the uh, the carbon-14 dating method relies on a ratio of carbon-14, <coughs> excuse me, carbon-14 to carbon-12. And there's no one that can actually tell you what that ratio was 4,500 years, 6,000 years, because there, there's so much carbon stored in the earth at the moment in coal, uh, oil, gas, etc., that uh, it's impossible to, to determine the, the ratio. I mean, they use a standard uh, C14, C12 ratio based on I think it's pre-1940s, and assume that it was constant all the way through, and it's not true. By the way, George, the reason we used the 1941 is that we blew up the world with atomic bombs after that. Yes. We changed the 1914 date. So if we can change it ourselves, why argue it hasn't ever changed from natural reasons? Cor correct, yeah, yeah. And I've seen some of those spikes in those graphs, John, where they... Well, they looked at the nuclear explosions in Australia and everywhere else they did them, and there was a real spike in C14 in the atmosphere. So, yes, you're right. That's why they went to the pre-1940s. Amen. Amen. Well said, uh, gentlemen. So once again, uh, that wraps up another uh, awesome must-watch uh, interview and presentation, John. To the audience, please share this around. This information is incredibly important. As I always say, it's 2021 and it's a great time to be a young earth creationist. So uh, any final words from you, uh, John, before we close it down? Yes, it's a very important one. Since the Bible is emphatic that all things were created by Jesus Christ, think carefully. No wonder he could turn water into wine and he didn't need a brewery. He just spoke and it happened. You will yes. take six months in a brewery to turn water into wine, provided you have all the other ingredients. No wonder he could heal the sick and raise the dead because he made life in the first place, but he knew one parameter that he imposed upon it himself. If I'm going to make a living being, then all the plants have to be in place. To have the plants, the worms need to be there. To have the worms, the bacteria that digest the plants need to be there. The planet has to be a certain size. And I can't even bring a woman along in the afternoon until the sun and the moon are there to make it all nice and romantic and they can tell which direction they're going into. So the creator himself dictates that time is not needed. He, he is the one who puts the limit on it. The six days of creation are designed to point to him as well as his glory and grandeur in creation. So can I encourage you? If you want to sort this whole issue out, you need to know Jesus Christ personally as your saviour. 
And uh, J John, you, you've you've obviously got a few fans in the audience. Um, uh, Timothy, in particular, must follow follow you, and he says, uh, "Does John have any creation conversations coming up?" Good. <laughs> Yeah. Well, thank you so much again, uh, John. And those are some awesome final words because we could win arguments all day, but it's about winning souls. It's about bringing people the gospel and to uh, Jesus Christ. So I really appreciate that. George, any final words, brother? No, I'd just like to thank John again. And uh, every time, you know, we've spoken, he's never said no to me. He's always willing to come on. That's fantastic. A true Aussie. <laughs> amen. Amen. Oi, oi, oi. And you're a fan favorite. We still got 52 people in the chat, John, so we can listen to you all day. That being said, uh, God bless you, George and John. Thank God you. bless everybody in the chat. Standing for Truth is out.